In this video, we'll cover Viktor Frankl's seminal Man's Search for Meaning, and we'll discuss his theory of logotherapy, the Sunday Scaries, and more. Before we jump in, a word of caution. This video covers dark, mature topics involving the Holocaust. So, if you're not in a good mental space, it might not be the right thing for you. Oh, and there are chapters broken out below if you want to jump to our particular section. Viktor Frankl, born in 1905, was an Austrian psychologist, author of 39 books, and survivor of the Holocaust. Man's Search for Meaning is his 1946 book detailing his personal account of his three years across four concentration camps during World War II, as well as his theory of logotherapy, which we'll discuss later. Dr. Frankl, what is meant by logotherapy? Uh, therapy means uh, healing and logos means meaning. Thus, logotherapy is really healing through meaning, although this, of course, is an oversimplification. So, first things first, you absolutely have to read this book. It's intense and, of course, horrific, but no matter where you are in life, it's well worth it. Plus, it's very short. It can be read in an afternoon. It sold over 16 million copies across 50 languages. The Library of Congress named it one of the 10 most influential books in the United States. And it's appeared on countless top 10 lists across the genres of memoirs, psychology, and self-help. I think this top Amazon review puts it best. If you're in pain, read this book. If you're scared, read this book. If you are lost, read this book. If you are happy, read this book. If you have time, read this book. If you don't have time, read this book. Read this book. Read this book. And recall the quote from philosopher George Santayana. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. I believe most versions of this book are broken up in at least two parts. The first is his personal account of life in concentration camps. The second is his psychotherapeutic approach called logotherapy. Now, the stories Frankel tells from the camps are, of course, extremely difficult to get through. It's one atrocity after another. And I will say this is one of the reasons why I actually recommend this book. Um, when I first read this back in 2015, I was in the throes of a fairly rough patch in my own life. But reading this book put all of that in a completely different perspective. My daily existence felt unbearable before, but when contrasted with the daily reality of a concentration camp, I mean, there really is no comparison. You know, After reading this book, you might find yourself much more grateful for your current lot in life. And that's not to say something like first world suffering isn't real suffering. Pain is pain. And given this channel we'll be discussing truth in life, we will be forced to discuss suffering. But as bad as you might have it, it's almost definitely not as bad as the Holocaust. In the preface of this version, Frankl briefly discusses an impossible choice he has to make after Hitler occupies Austria. He's offered an invitation for an immigration visa to the United States, which was an incredible opportunity for Frankl, but he would have had to leave his old parents behind to meet their likely fates in concentration camps. It's a life-changing dilemma because he wants to pursue his life's work in his theory of logotherapy, but also feels responsibility for looking after his parents. After great consternation, he is reminded of the commandment, honor thy father and thy mother, and decides to let his American visa lapse to stay with his parents. Before you can even begin to process the fortitude and character it takes to make a decision like that, he moves into part one experiences in a concentration camp. Frankl tells many stories of the absolute horrors of camp life. If you've ever watched a documentary on the Holocaust or Schindler's List, you might recall those terrible images. Still, you should read the book to hear his own first-person accounts. They're almost like parables themselves. He discusses the three physiological stages experienced by all inmates to various degrees. First, shock while entering the camp. Second, after some time, apathy, and a focus on survival for oneself and one's closest companions. Third, if the prisoner survives and is eventually liberated from the camp, 
feelings of depersonalization, resentment, and disillusionment. One of the most jarring passages is when Dr. Frankel works in a hut treating typhus patients. His aide has to remove a man who has just died and drags his body along the floor by his legs. Having to drag him up the stairs, the corpse's head bumps up the two steps. Frankel clarifies that this is not done out of malice by his aide, but rather detachment. After months or years in the camp, and in the midst of such daily horror, the inmates lost much of their capacity to respond emotionally. Frankel goes on to say, while eating a meager cup of soup, I happened to look out the window. The corpse, which had just been removed, stared in at me with glazed eyes. Two hours before, I had spoken to that man. Now I continued sipping my soup. Again, this is not done out of coldness, but rather is a result of the blunting of emotions due to the appalling camp conditions. Another account by Frankel explains what he considered to be the most painful of experiences, brought on by the mental agony caused by injustice. He notices his friend, who has a dislocated hip, was carrying heavy support beams over icy tracks. His friend was about to fall, so Frankel jumped to help him without stopping to think. He was immediately hit on the back by a guard, rudely reprimanded, and ordered to return to his spot in line. Adding insult to injury, that same guard had just told the men that they lacked the spirit of camaraderie. As Frankel put it, at such a moment, it is not the physical pain which hurts the most, and this applies to adults as much as to punish children. It is the mental agony caused by the injustice, the unreasonableness of it all. There is so much wisdom found throughout this book. For a few pages, he writes about how, while forced to march in the cold for miles, he felt an awe-inspiring communion with his wife, who he hadn't seen since they were separated for concentration camps. Even though she was not physically there, he could feel her presence, the feeling that he was able to touch her, stretch out his hand, and grasp hers. As he writes, Then I grasped the meaning of the greatest secret that human poetry and human thought and belief have to impart. The salvation of man is through love and in love. And a page later, love goes very far beyond the physical person of the beloved. It finds its deepest meaning in his spiritual being, his inner self. Whether or not he's actually present, whether or not he is alive at all, ceases somehow to be of importance. Before we dive into logotherapy, one more essential passage. We who lived in concentration camps can remember the men who walked through the huts comforting others, giving away their last piece of bread. They may have been few in number, but they offer sufficient proof that everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. In part two of the book, Frankel discusses his psychiatric theory called logotherapy, which he had actually been working on before his admission into the concentration camps. He writes that aspiring to complete his life's work helped him during his darkest hours. Put simply, logotherapy theorizes that the primary motivating force of a human being is to seek meaning in life. In other words, if we cannot change the situation, we have always the last freedom to change our attitude to that situation. I find it useful to contrast logotherapy with the driving life philosophies of other historical thinkers. So to Karl Marx, the primary motivating force would likely be economic. Sigmund Freud would theorize the primary driver of humans as sex or pleasure seeking. Alfred Adler theorized it was man's pursuit of power. Joseph Campbell thought people ultimately sought the experience or rapture of being alive. With all due respect to these impressive minds, I think they're all wrong in that Frankel is right. That's not to say that those motivators aren't very real and intrinsic motivators for people. The question I ask is, if you had to choose one ultimate single motivator, what would it be? 
I think Frankel is closest with the need to seek meaning. I believe for any concrete life philosophy, one must consider how it will withstand a number of conditions. Unfortunately, Frankel's theory of logotherapy was put to the real test for him in the concentration camps. And I don't think the other four perspectives laid out would better withstand the horrors of the Holocaust. There was simply no escape from the suffering. What Frankel argued you needed was a reason to go on despite the suffering. He quotes Nietzsche, He who has a why to live for can bear almost any how. How does one find meaning? As he writes, we can discover this meaning in life in three different ways. One, by creating a work or doing a deed. Two, by experiencing something or encountering someone. And three, by the attitude we take toward unavoidable suffering. And that everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. That last point is crucial. We always have a choice of how to respond in a situation. The ultimate ability is choosing how to feel and how to frame your circumstances. One of the more memorable excerpts from the book is when an elderly man comes to Frankel because of his severe depression. This man couldn't overcome the loss of his wife, who died two years earlier. So Frankel asked him, What would have happened, doctor, if you had died first and your wife would have had to survive you? Oh, he said, for her, this would have been terrible, how she would have suffered. Whereupon I replied, you see, doctor, such a suffering has been spared her, and it was you who have spared her the suffering, to be sure at the price that now you have to survive and mourn her. He said no word, but shook my hand and calmly left my office. In some way, suffering ceases to be suffering at the moment it finds a meaning, such as the meaning of a sacrifice. It's such a beautiful way to frame a tragic situation. Frankel goes on to clarify, though. But let me make it perfectly clear that in no way is suffering necessary to find meaning. I only insist that meaning is possible even in spite of suffering, provided certainly that the suffering is unavoidable. If it were avoidable, however, the meaningful thing to do would be to remove its cause, be it psychological, biological, or political. To suffer unnecessarily is masochistic rather than heroic. Another core concept of logotherapy, where I believe Frankel is correct again, is his belief that one must not aim for success or happiness. Rather, success and happiness are a byproduct of aiming at your ultimate purpose. The self-transcendence of human existence denotes the fact that being human always points and is directed to something or someone other than oneself, be it a meaning to fulfill or another human being to encounter. The more one forgets himself by giving himself to a cause to serve or another person to love, the more human he is and the more he actualizes himself. What is called self-actualization is not an attainable aim at all for the simple reason that the more one would strive for it, the more he would miss it. In other words, self-actualization is possible only as a side effect of self-transcendence. I believe Frankel nails this concept. We can relate this to psychologist Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We have these lower needs that likely need to be met before higher level needs can be undertaken. Most often, self-actualization is at the top of the pyramid but I think the concept of transcending above the self is the true highest value. You have to orient yourself in the proper direction to something beyond yourself. Otherwise, as Frankel puts it, you find yourself in an existential vacuum. Just consider the mass neurotic syndrome so pervasive in the young generation. There is ample empirical evidence that the three facets of the syndrome, depression, aggression, addiction, are due to what is called in logotherapy the existential vacuum, a feeling of emptiness and meaninglessness. Unless you've been living under a rock, you can see that there's a real existential vacuum prevalent in society right now. Many people have comfortably met the lower tiers of the hierarchy, yet suffer from depression and meaninglessness. Frankel again. To the European, 
It is a characteristic of the American culture that, again and again, one is commanded and ordered to be happy. But happiness cannot be pursued. It must ensue. One must have a reason to be happy. Once the reason is found, however, one becomes happy automatically. As we see, a human being is not one in pursuit of happiness, but rather in search of a reason to become happy. Last but not least, through actualizing the potential meaning inherent and dormant in a given situation. I'm afraid what America has been exporting to the rest of the world is a hyper-focus on money, fame, and cheap pleasures to the detriment of meaning. A 2019 Harris poll of 3,000 kids between the ages of 8 and 12 were asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? In America and the UK, the top response was YouTuber slash vlogger. In China, the top response was astronaut. Our kids want to be social media stars, and who could blame them? I think it was Ryan Seacrest who put it best. This is America, where everyone has the right to life, love, and the pursuit of fame. Now, I do appreciate the irony of someone on YouTube complaining about kids wanting to make it big on YouTube. In my defense, this channel is attempting to transcend the noise of the modern world. Do I hope that's popular? Yes, yes I do. In a prior video, we covered Neil Postman, a 20th century cultural critic, who warned us about how technology and television could tear apart the fabric of our society. If you're interested, that's linked above and below in the description. Back to the widespread 20th century problem Frankl called the existential vacuum, a feeling of emptiness and meaninglessness, which manifests primarily in a state of boredom. In an old survey of his pupils, he found 25% of his European students had some degree of existential vacuum. For his American students, it wasn't 25%, it was 60%. He then goes on to define Sunday Neurosis, that kind of depression which afflicts people who become aware of the lack of content in their lives when the rush of the busy week is over and the void within themselves becomes manifest. If that sounds familiar to you, many people now call it the Sunday Night Blues or Sunday Scaries. I can certainly attest to that feeling throughout my own professional career. I couldn't quite track down the etymology of the term Sunday Scaries. Looking at Google Trends, the phrase was dormant prior to 2014. Frankl may have foretold this modern phenomenon. People probably experienced this Sunday night neurosis for a variety of reasons. Frankl would likely say these individuals hadn't found their purpose, or haven't ascribed their suffering to a higher meaning. Now, what can we do about the Sunday Scaries? There are many ways to tackle them. One way that may be helpful is to look at the work week ahead and try to find opportunities where you can experience flow or a sense of timelessness in engaging work. We covered Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's revolutionary concept of flow in an earlier video, which you can find linked above and below. I would like to briefly address the rare and I think undeserved criticism laid onto Frankel by a minority of analysts. One is this idea that a positive attitude was essential to surviving the camps. But Frankel kind of addresses this in the book, writing, some men lost all hope, but it was the incorrigible optimists who were the most irritating companions. Frankel didn't believe in the idea of a delusional optimism in the face of reality. Frankel would say that having a strong mental frame is vital. Frankel argues instead for a tragic optimism. I speak of a tragic optimism that is, an optimism in the face of tragedy, and in view of the human potential, which at its best allows for, one, turning suffering into a human achievement and accomplishment, two, deriving from guilt the opportunity to change oneself for the better, and three, deriving from life's transitoriness an incentive to take responsible action. This can be contrasted to what we see so often on social media, the modern psychological concept called toxic positivity. This would be forced happiness or an overemphasis on positive vibes, the generalization of an optimistic mental state for all situations. Frankel and logotherapy clearly see through this facade. A positive frame is helpful, but not alone sufficient. 
It's the belief that life has meaning despite the suffering. There's much more to cover on logotherapy. This was just a primer. Logotherapy is spreading worldwide, and many concepts from logotherapy have been integrated into other forms of therapy, including cognitive behavioral therapy and acceptance and commitment therapy. A few things to leave you with. The first is an interesting exchange Frankel shares from a therapeutic group session. Addressing myself to the whole group, the question was whether an ape which was being used to develop poliomyelitis serum, and for this reason, punctured again and again, would ever be able to grasp the meaning of its suffering. Unanimously, the group replied that of course it would not. With its limited intelligence, it could not enter into the world of man, i.e. the only world in which the meaning of its suffering would be understandable. Then I pushed forward with the following question. And what about man? Are you sure that the human world is a terminal point in the evolution of the cosmos? Is it not conceivable that there is still another dimension, a world beyond man's world, a world in which the question of an ultimate meaning of human suffering would find an answer? This passage only hit me on my third reading of the book. It seems more likely to me that Frankl meant this as potentially another spiritual dimension instead of a higher physical plane. This channel will cover more in higher dimensions in the future. And as a stepping stone to understanding dimensions, consider watching our video on fourth dimensional shapes above or in the description. Fourth dimension. Did I mention the fourth dimension? Secondly, one last quote from Frankel to sum everything up. Forces beyond your control can take away everything you possess except one thing your freedom to choose how you will respond to the situation. You cannot control what happens to you in life, but you can always control what you will feel and do about what happens to you. I know this video was very long. Thank you so much for watching, but you still need to read this book. There are so many stories and quotes which I had to leave out so that this video wasn't five hours. So this was my first video on my channel in front of the camera. I know this was a very heavy topic to start off on. I kept putting it off for that very reason. But the message of this book is too important to dodge. I promise that most of my videos will not be so dark or emotionally draining. Please let me know in the comments below if you prefer this format or the stock footage format I've been using. I hope to publish these lessons for people in a structure you'll get the most from. Please like and subscribe and thanks again.